Daniel Penny choked Jordan Neely for a reported 15 minutes until he died. Now he's talking about testifying in his own grand jury hearing. That's entirely out of the ordinary. But I think this is a good example for us to talk about what it means for a grand jury, what it means to be charged, different ways of charging, and most importantly, why uh, people who pretend to be law enforcement, who are law enforcement, want to testify in front of a grand jury and what that means. So to be charged with a crime, the, uh, a serious crime, the prosecution has to go through one of three different avenues. There's three different avenues that they can do. Number one is a grand jury. Number two is a preliminary hearing. And number three is information charging. Now, I'm talking to you about my jurisdiction as well as the model penal code. New York may have slightly separate laws. I'm sure I'll hear about it in the comments if they do. But let's talk about the way it works in the model penal code and see how it applies. Number one, the easiest one is information charging. It's basically police officers sign off on a police report. Now, this isn't usually available for every crime. Usually it's only available for sorts of statutory crimes where the only witnesses are police officer type of witnesses. For example, uh, drug possession, not the high end, high level drug sales, drug possession, pipe possession, the type of thing where you might be found in a stolen car, things of that nature. This is what called information charging. You don't need to go, a judge basically reviews the police reports, signs off on it, and then what happens is, uh, the same thing is, had they gone to what's called a preliminary hearing, the cops are just going to testify from their police reports anyway because they're all professional witnesses. Because of that, that's usually what we see as far as information charging goes. Information charging is only available for the lowest type of felony offenses, not usually for manslaughter, murder type of offenses. So it's not really relevant here, but it's important you know about it. The other two ways are preliminary hearings and grand juries. Now, if you're arrested, you have a right to a preliminary hearing within a certain short period of time. In my jurisdiction, I believe it's 48 hours from the point of being charged. You have a right to a preliminary hearing within being charged if you're in custody, meaning if you're in jail, or if you're out of jail, it's uh, within 30 days. Now, the defense can always ask for a continuance on a preliminary hearing in order for them to get ready. But you have a strict time limit because you have a right to a speedy trial. But in this case, you have a right to a hearing within that period of time. A preliminary hearing is basically a mini trial, usually in front of one judge, which they call in witnesses to testify against the accused. The standard of proof is much lower. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's only usually more likely than not that there's a probable cause to hold the person that a reasonable person would believe based on the evidence deduced that it's likely uh, that they committed a crime, right? And the defense in that case gets to confront the witnesses. The thing about a preliminary hearing is uh, not only do they put the witnesses normally don't have as much time to prepare, they don't know as clearly, they haven't rehearsed it in their head, they may not have sat with the prosecutor as long, so they're not as ready. And because of that, the defense is usually able to get more information from them as far as um, things that may be fresh in their mind, they may be easier to find witnesses that contradict each other, find ways they contradict their own statement. That's the benefit for a defendant with a preliminary hearing. Now, the benefit for the prosecution for a preliminary hearing is that because it's a confrontational hearing, it's more likely at a trial level, if these witnesses disappear, that the testimony from a preliminary hearing may be used during an actual trial. During an actual trial, it's very hard to use grand jury uh, testimony unless they're using the grand jury testimony as a way to impeach you in your testimony at trial. Now let's talk about what a grand jury is. A grand jury is a larger jury than what's the petite jury, the 12 or six people who sit in judgment during a regular trial. Uh, there's a certain statutory number, sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's 16, usually you need three quarters of a certain amount of that number who's sworn in, often they'll serve for a year at a time. They listen to a bunch of information about a case, and again, the standard is more likely than not, if it's more likely than not that they believe there is a, that the crime was afoot, that there's reason to believe this person committed this particular crime that they're accused of, if that exists, what they do is they charge you and then you have to face the actual procedure of a criminal case. The grand jury, the preliminary hearing, these are gatekeeps on the runaway power of the prosecutor. The fact that prosecutors have so much power that it's not unheard of that prosecutors have so much power that what they could do is really charge almost anybody of anything. The idea of either the preliminary hearing where a judge gets to look at the evidence and say, well, 
I don't know if we should really charge this. How often that frequently happens, I'm not sure. Or the grand jury where citizens get to hear that evidence and say, you know, I'm not sure if we should really charge this based on the evidence the prosecution brings before them. Now, in a grand jury hearing, this is not an adversarial process where you do have a right to be present at your own preliminary hearing, uh, usually because you're already on bail or under court supervision, but you have a right to be present in your own hearing with your attorney. Your attorney has a right to confront the witness. The grand jury, that does not occur. In the grand jury, uh, it is the grand jury, the witness who is testifying, and in many jurisdictions, most jurisdictions, the prosecutor, which sort of leads the process, they're the ones who ask the questions, and sort of spoon feeds the grand jury what the information is. Now, even though they spoon feed the grand jury what the information is, in many states, there's laws that if the prosecutor knows certain types of information, for example, usually the phrase is clearly exculpatory, which as you can understand, uh, covers very, very little. But if they do have clearly exculpatory information, which means evidence that clearly shows they're not guilty, they do have to present that to the grand jury. Now, if they had evidence that clearly showed someone is not guilty, they really shouldn't be presenting a case at all, quite frankly. So it's a safeguard, which is, again, true in theory, not really true in practice. So this is what's interesting about the grand jury process in this case in particular. When it comes to the grand jury, uh, it's a private hearing. You're not allowed to discuss what's inside. Technically, you shouldn't even know who's coming up uh, to be investigated at any particular day. There's a whole number of different safeguards of the grand jury process to protect uh, both the defendant, but also to protect any potential witnesses for the prosecution. The idea that all of this is public at this point is actually usually against the spirit, if not the letter of the law, depending on your jurisdiction, of the grand jury process. So it's very interesting for us to realize that we all seem to know what they, they meet, who they're investigating. We don't actually know what charge they're investigating yet, or we know what the uh, event is. We don't know if they're pursuing which particular charge in the grand jury. We don't know what questions they're asking. But the fact that we know that he's talking about speaking in his own defense tells us that the secrecy of the grand jury, at least at a minimum, has been broken and they know about it. Now, do you have a right to testify in your own defense at a grand jury? What I'm going to tell you is, as far as I know, the ones I've seen, you absolutely do not. I don't know if New York has changed this law. So there is a missing piece to this. And like I guess, New York has its own rule, which promises the defendant a right to testify at the grand jury. Now, this is different than the model penal code, and that's why this is even an option for this case. I apologize if the sound is off because I'm recording indoors, uh, but that's why I like doing this because when I do these videos, I also get to learn new things. This rule is from New York's Criminal Procedure Law Section 190.50 parentheses 5, and for that reason, it's called a cross notice with that section number attached. Now, that notice must have three essential requirements in order to be valid. Uh, number one, it must be served on the prosecutor before the filing of the indictment. Number two, it must be in writing. And uh, it's common that it's often on the back of a business card, even that's okay. And three, it must be by an attorney and include the attorney's address in order to schedule the defendant's testimony. Hence, the back of the business card, the address is right there on it. Uh, so what does this allow the defendant to do? He can testify, but uh, there are restrictions, there are downsides that are important to understand. Uh, the, defendant, the defendant can only sit in the grand jury room during his own testimony. What does that mean? It's not like a trial where he can watch all the evidence from beginning to end, and then when he decides to testify, he's heard what other people have said about him. Uh, at the point the defendant testifies, he may not know what the other witness is, uh, if they've produced video, even if they've produced diagram or who they produced, he may not know any of those things. And for that reason, he may not be able to answer directly any certain accusations that have made against him, for example. Uh, in addition, his attorney can't object to any questions that are asked either of the defendant or of the other witnesses. And the attorney is not allowed to ask questions of the defendant, the other witnesses, or the information previously admitted to the grand jury. The only thing the attorney can do is uh, whisper silently, quietly, advice. Uh, he can sit in the room, but only during the point the defendant is testifying and only on advice on the law for per questions that are being asked to him by the prosecution or the members of the grand jury. Now, as always, 
the defendant does have the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. We've talked about the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So testifying at, at the grand jury is giving up that right for the purpose of the grand jury process. You would never be required to testify to convict yourself. This would be giving up that right and giving testimony. But if you do give testimony before the grand jury, be very, very aware that if you testify in a way which they choose to either believe uh, parts of it or discount parts of it that defend you and believe the parts that only convict you or, or incriminate you, you could be incriminating yourself if that's what you choose to do. So uh, testify to the grand jury is giving up the Fifth Amendment right for that purpose and comes with all the same problems as ever making a statement in your own defense. I know there are some states where the police union has put it in their contract that they have a right to testify in any case that they're bringing against police officers. They've tried to negotiate that in or they have negotiated that in. In fact, one of the few places, the only time I ever see people testifying in their own defense is in law enforcement cases. And it very seems to be what this is telegraphing to us that what Jordan Neely, excuse me, what Daniel Penny is doing is running what's functionally a law enforcement defense. What he's doing is saying, I needed to do it. I was acting, if not under color of law, as a good Samaritan, which we've heard people say about him. And because of that, I had to act this way. They, he needed me to do this to protect the public. And he's gonna attempt to present that to the grand jury in order to not get charged. So this is a real interesting question I was asked. And I didn't even realize because it had been uh, in my system knowing this for so long that it, it's very interesting. He's already been charged with the case, uh, but they haven't had the preliminary hearing yet. So why are they going with the grand jury process in addition to him already being charged? He's currently charged with manslaughter. So there's a couple different reasons, and let's talk about what those could be. One could be that they're aiming for a higher level of charge. One thing uh, prosecutors use the grand jury for is to basically cast stones but hide their hand. So if they charge him in front of the grand jury and the grand jury charges him with attempted murder, or in this case, actual murder, whether it's one or two, depending on the jurisdiction, what would end up happening is the prosecutor could say, hey, we didn't want to charge him with murder. We left that to the grand jury and this jury of his peers decided this is what he's guilty of. So the other reason, which ends up being more likely is that they don't charge and the prosecutor can say, hey, we tried to charge him and we were unable to because the grand jury came back and said, hey, we don't think this meets the burden or the, the standard that they need to meet in order to charge this case. We've seen this in other cases nat nat nationally when what they've tried to do is charge, especially police officers, and the grand jury has come back not to do it. Now, it's a little bit disingenuous and the purpose is to, again, uh, throw stones and hide their hand because 100% of the evidence with the grand jury hears generally is provided by the prosecutor. It's not an adversarial system. The prosecutor is the one who provides the evidence. The prosecutor is the one who uh, figures out which questions to ask. The grand jury can usually ask their own generally, but they're the ones who present the case. Now, if the grand jury then no longer wants to charge the person based on the case presented, um, it's like blaming the diner at the restaurant that the food didn't taste any good. The prosecutor was the cook. They're the ones who uh, fried up that steak. So if it's not any good, blame the chef. Don't go and say the diner's no good. And I think that's what we're looking at here as far as these things go. You may not even know that they're bringing a grand jury charge against you. Uh, often you have to petition the court or beg the prosecutors to do it. Now, does a prosecutor want you to testify? Could be up to the prosecutor, depends on the case. The good thing for a prosecutor if you testify in your own defense is that you're tied to whatever statement you make. Whatever statement you make, you made under oath in a court proceeding and it can be brought in against you at trial, whether it's for impeachment or whether it's brought in as an admission, which is a, either a, a exception to the hearsay rule or outside the hearsay rule, depending upon your uh, jurisdiction. So you've already been charged with uh, in court, but you haven't had your preliminary hearing yet, which is bound by a particular time limit, but you also now have to face a grand jury. How do you get charged twice? What's going on? Well, number one, you can't face trial for two separate, uh, event, two separate events of the same charge, excuse me, two separate charges of the same event, unless it's at the same time. So if what they're doing is before you have the preliminary hearing, charge you with the grand jury, they could do that in order to protect the witnesses, 
um, spoon feed the grand jury, do different things of that nature as a way to make sure the, the defendant's defense doesn't have the ability to cross-examine these witnesses, right? That's the general reason. So for example, many sex assault type of cases, many, um, especially cases where we want to protect the children, where maybe children are going to be the witnesses, they'll do that in grand jury because it's not adversarial. Because it's not adversarial, the defense attorney doesn't get to ask any questions. Uh, they could keep it very sort of uh, couch them in um, safety, so to speak. They're not going to be confronted under cross-examination the way they would under uh, trial cases where preliminary hearing is much closer to trial. If the defense attorney wants to go after them, wants to be very confrontational, wants to get them on the, they really have the right to do that. A uh, grand jury protects them from that. That being said, why they then would invite the defendant to speak at the grand jury. I think we understand where that comes from and what that is, because we only ever see it in cases like Ferguson, cases like this one. I've very, I'm sure someone can send me a list of cases where it happens all the time, but I've never seen it. In fact, usually it's a surprise when you're confronted by a grand jury, unless you show up for the preliminary hearing. And upon showing up for the preliminary hearing, it's not uncommon, especially in these sex assault type of cases, these other type of cases, where they say, oh no, we've already proceeded by grand jury. The judge is going to unseal the warrant on Thursday, or they unsealed it today. And they serve him the warrant as he leaves the preliminary hearing sort of situation that's not uncommon at all so it's an interesting mix of the procedures i think it's sort of unfortunate that they would hold him for a hearing they know is never going to take place then run a grand jury proceeding to replace the hearing they know is never going to place place i think it's slightly disingenuous but i don't get asked about if i think that's ethical or not as far as that kind of thing goes finally as far as this case goes as far as uh, daniel petty's case i'm gonna be very clear about this i don't think you deserve the death penalty excuse me i don't think you deserve the death penalty for being obnoxious on a train. I don't think being obnoxious, outlandish, threatening people with uh, sort of actions that you don't have the power to take very, very clearly, I don't think you get the death penalty for that. And I definitely don't think an ordinary citizen gets the right to uh, hold someone for what's been reported as 15 minutes in a chokehold well after any danger they posed has long since passed until they get to kill the person. That's not America. That's not what I signed up for. It shouldn't be allowed as far as I'm concerned. I don't think that stands your ground, especially after the 10th minute. I think we've seen that previously. So this is a very um, tragic case. I'm going to say for all people involved, because I don't want Daniel Penny to have to go to jail. But the reason I don't want him to have to go to jail is because I want Jordan Neely to be alive. I want the system to support Jordan Neely in what he needs so Daniel Perry never gets caught up on his way to wherever he's going that he doesn't feel the need to functionally kill someone. So I hope that helps. I hope that tells you the difference between uh, preliminary hearing, grand jury hearings, things of that nature. Let me know if you have any other questions. Let me see what I can do to answer as far as these things go. Thank you very much for your time, as always. So now that we know there is a specific rule for New York cases that allow a defendant to show up and testify in their own defense at the grand jury. I'd be interested in anybody who practices in New York, who has appeared before a New York grand jury, to let me know, is this more common in New York than I think nationwide? Because I honestly have never heard it locally that someone would go do it. I've only heard about it in cases where it's law enforcement uh, testifying, saying why it was so necessary to shoot and or to kill somebody. So my question to New York attorneys is, how often do you file these notices? And uh, is this in every case, for example? Uh, what are the ramifications of that in real life, in actual practice? Tell me.